So can you like introduce like your background a little bit? Yeah, so I've been working doing sports performance before it was really a popular thing. Started in about 1991. Uh, I started with my first professional golfer in 1998. So, you know, before golf fitness was really a popular thing and before it was a thing that was so common out there, I've been doing this for a long time and, you know, have enjoyed not only working with the golfers, but there's a lot of cool science in golf because the ball's sitting still, you go when you want, you don't have to react, you can have 3D cameras and force plates and you can collect all kinds of biomechanical data real easy because of the situation of the sport, right? Like the ball sitting there, you kind of just get set up, you hit it when you want, you know, there's nothing to react to. So it's our, our ability from a science perspective to study it and understand how the best in the world do it is actually really good compared to most other sports due to the constraints of how the game works. So, you know, I started digging into and getting involved with 3D biomechanics and ground forces originally it was more just pressure. We had like pressure plates and now obviously we have pressure and force and then the force went just vertical and now force is 3D and then it was one plate, now it's two plates, right? And it's constantly evolving that our understanding of how each segment contributes to speed and all of those things uh, work. So, you know, I just kind of tried to stay on the forefront of that stuff. I sit on the board and help different companies in these spaces uh, like Swing Catalyst, et cetera. And, you know, it's been a pretty cool evolution and we really are starting to understand the, what the best players do. We have to understand the why, like what's going on with their body, you know, what does their body do well and all that stuff. And then matching up what they do well physiologically with biomechanics. Cause you know, you can think of like, I like to tell my players, there's two things, right. For golfers, at least like there's rotary biomechanics, which are the general rotary philosophies that fit across all rotary sports, whether it be throwing a baseball, hitting a ball, tennis, you golf, you name it, right? There's these general rotary mechanics. And then there's some specific rotary mechanics that start relating to how the club relates to the body, right? And, you know, those pieces and how you connect that. But that if you don't have this fundamental good human rotary mechanics to start uh it's going to make the tough <laughs> the rest a lot tougher cool. so we've been doing a long time i like i said i've also worked with golfers because it's a nice uh, i mean hockey players because it's a nice compliment so like when our younger athletes are in golf season and they're training a bit less and they're playing a bunch more well that's off season for our hockey guys where they're in full time killing it in, in the gym him five six days a week you know all that kind of stuff and then what happens is when the hockey players go back in season here in the northeast where i live the weather turns cold and the golfers come back in so it's a nice complementary uh sport for it and because they're so different it keeps it enjoyable for me because i got you know there's some commonality in it but at the same time there's some difference so and different types of athletes different type of people so it keeps it a bit interesting for me throughout the year. So I don't get bored only doing one thing. So I really love the combination of the two. Cool. Cool. So since you brought up rotary mechanic, can you like explain it to us? Like when a golfer use a golf, like use a bat to hit the ball or when the hockey player going to hit the goal, how does that work? Yeah, so basically there's two things we look at, right? We have the kinematic data, and you can think about the kinematic data as the movements of the segments, how fast are they moving? You know, we measure that in degrees of rotation per second. You know, is the knee extending? Is it flexing? Like, am I how fast am I turning? Am I, am I, what parts of my body are moving forward? What parts are moving up? What parts are moving back? What parts are moving right? What parts are moving left? And you're measuring all of these movements, Right. And we call that the kinematics of the movement. Um, but movement is driven by forces. Right. With the forces create the movement. And that we call the kinetics. The kinetics are the forces. And we're typically measuring that uh, on force plates where we're using 3D measurement systems to measure kinematics. And nowadays there's all kinds of technology saying that they can convert 3D into kinetics. And there's, you know, 3D systems that are advanced, you know, with cameras all around you in a room and markers all over your body, now all the way down to just using your cell phone. I mean, obviously, the accuracy 
is not quite as good using one cell phone versus 16 high-speed cameras with markers in a laboratory. Um, but it's a pretty cool time where there's an evolution of all of this technology going on. Um, and even some people starting to say they can use like a phone to get the kinematics and then they can reverse engineer the math and tell you what the kinetics were as well. I'm not totally sure. Like a lot of that is being done right now by using estimates of the mass of the segments, meaning it'd be really hard to figure out true kinetics without force plates, without knowing the size, the mass of your legs or your torso or your arms, right? Because the mass itself plays a role in the forces, right? Somebody who has is big and heavy and has big segments needs more force to move those segments fast than somebody who's lighter and has smaller segments can move those segments fast with less force. So there is this interrelationship. And right now, the people who are using video and other sources to say they're getting kinetics, they're using just stuff from literature that says, on average, a thigh is this big or an arm is this big, right? And there's probably, you know, so it's probably decent for some people and not as good for others. And it's certainly not exact, you know, the way it would be if you're literally standing on the force plate and it knows exactly how much load and force and everything is being put through those strain gauges. So, you know, it's a pretty cool time where we can start looking at it. And then now we understand we have all this data. We understand that human mechanics, like there's an order to these things, right? And things should happen in order. And like I said, kinetics precede kinematics, meaning the forces create motions. So we know like in trend, let's say in golf, um, that if we look at the three primary forces, we have this linear force or horizontal force we could think about as like away from the target and toward the target, right? I move in my backswing, I might move away from the, the pin a little bit. And as I move into the ball, I get a little bit closer. So we have that, we can call that the horizontal or the linear force, however you want to think about it, right? Then we have obviously a force that's front to back, like our toes, right? We have a rotary force that creates the rotations, Right. And then we have this vertical force. You see people post up. You see a Justin Thomas. You see Alexi Thompson. You see a Bubba Watson. They're literally off the ground when they hit the ball. That's how big their vertical forces are. Right. So we know in our kinetics in any sport that the linear force happens first, the rotary force happens second. Right. That's that push pull of the feet and the twisting of the feet. And then that vertical piece comes last, right? And you can imagine seeing that in golf, like you kind of turn back, you bump into the ball. And in old school golf instruction, they would say bump, meaning move forward, bump and turn, right? And so it's like bump, turn, and then lift up. And you not pick up, but push down against the ground for you to actually go up, right? And we see this in baseball and pitching, right? They keep the front side closed. They take their stride to throw the pitch. So that's your linear the foot hits, they start turning, and then they that lead leg that hits the ground bent starts straightening up, and they can then get that vertical to rotate against that post, right? So we have this sequencing of events, meaning linear, rotary, vertical in our kinetics, and we also know then that should be related to the movement of the segments of the body. So that's your kinetic side. On the kinematic side, we know that the pelvis should be starting to rotate first, then the torso, then the arms, and then ultimately the club. If it's the club or a racket or a ball, it's like, you know, some people would say if there's nothing there, you can measure the wrist, right? So you can go pelvis, torso, arm, wrist versus club. You know, you can measure a different way. You know, people will call it hand. They might put the sensor on their hand or whatever, but whatever that distal segment may be. And we know those things happen in order because that's what loads the muscular system the most efficiently to create this spring-like whippy uh, summation of speeds and forces. So, you know, it's really cool. So you, now you have technology where you can measure this, right? And you might turn around and say, oh, the rotary part's not good. Well, then you go back and look at your physical assessments and say, well, how's this person's T-spine rotation? How's this person's internal, external hip rotation? Like, what are the rotary movements in the body of the segments? And do they do those well? Forget about actually throwing the ball, like just from a general assessment perspective. Do they move well in the tra transverse plane, right? Or maybe the laterals aren't good. Do they move well in the frontal plane? Maybe the verticals are not great. Do they move well in the sagittal plane, right? So we can kind of correlate where there might be issues. And then if we know, oh, they actually can do it physically, they can do it well, then we know it's a technique issue. 
But if they can't do it well, then we have to try to clean them up physically. And in, let's say it was rotary. They don't move well in the transverse plane, which is the most common one that people struggle in, especially as they age, right? So we know, oh, we got to get some better hip mobility, a little better thoracic mobility for us to change those things. We can't just chase that through technique and coaching because the athlete can't actually do it. So we need to make sure we improve their physiology and then see what happens. Sometimes you just fix their physiology and the numbers come in play. And it's like, boom, there it is, we're fixed. Sometimes you fix their physiology and then you still have to have a teaching component which gets them to learn how to use what you just gave them physically. So it's a little bit of a process, but it allows you to identify, don't spend your time spinning your wheels and in instruction and practicing your skill, fix your body first, or your body is fine. Let's go, you know, I got to sit down with my coach and I got to work on the technical sporting application of those skills. Love that. Love that approach. So since if, let's say if the, because we train a lot of like, the, we train a lot of players and each of the player have like, different probably like different movement patterns so for the rot rotation mo movement is there some some someone's probably going to use their upper body first someone is going to use their hip for rotate their hip first so well, it shouldn't be everybody should be going hip first yeah if they want if they want to be any good so uh, for the sequencing how to like correct the rotational sequencing if they use the the movement pattern like wrong how to correct so here's what i would say is like i don't like to say anything's ever an absolute so like i said it usually goes pelvis first torso second arms third we'll use the golf example the club last right so we know that's the optimal way to do it and that's what science says and people will tell you that's what tour players do but the reality is i have lots of data on tour players and not every one of them actually does do that some of them actually are going Pelvis first, torso, I mean, pelvis first, arms, then torso, and then club. And the reason they do that is because at the end of the day, you got to hit the ball and you got to hit it effectively. So I'll use Rory as an example. And I have some 3D from Rory from years ago. And I don't know if he still does it now or not, so I can't say. But some of his old 3D is he went pelvis, arm, arm second, torso third, club last. Everybody goes pelvis first. Of all the data I have, I probably have over 100 Four players everyone goes pelvis first and club last the, the middle can change so like someone like rory happens to be crazy mobile like he's got insane trunk rotation if you ever watch him in the gym do a gym do a reach back or any type of rotary exercise you're like oh my god this guy is the most flexible guy i've ever seen in the world so you know he had at that point when we did the 3d he only had his hips turning about 20 degrees and he had his shoulders like turn like 100 110 right Whoa. he's so flexible so if he went pelvis first then torso, then arms, with that much separation, he would never get his arms back to the ball in time, right? He would be so spun open and with his club trapped behind him, he needs to get the club back to the ball sooner because of 80 degrees, what we call X factor, the difference between the amount of pelvic rotation and the torso rotation. So if he left, if he left his arms back, he would never get it back to the ball. So does he have room for more speed? Well, probably but probably would kill his accuracy and his ability to do it. And Rory's a strong fit guy. So the bottom line is he's still one of the biggest hitters toward doing it slightly out of order, but allows him to create better impact alignments and hit better golf shots. So if you don't really understand it and you looked at his 3D, you might be trying to chase him to reverse that. But the reality is if you didn't understand his physiology and why he does it that way, you may try to change him and make him worse. And look, if you did it the wrong way and you hit it super short and you can't compete, well, that's a different conversation. But obviously everybody who follows golf knows that Rory hits it plenty far. That's not going to be yeah. his issue. So, you know, if you can still hit it 330 <laughs> out of order, good enough if you can hit the fairway, right? So we always got to be careful that we don't chase what we see as ideal without really understanding the underlying. And is it still good enough to play at a world-class level? And obviously for Rory it is. Yeah, love that. Love that. So there's no, there's no absolutes, I guess, is my point. You got to be careful. Yeah. You got to really understand it. Like, don't just learn it basically. Like, 
you got it's great to understand the general concept of rotary mechanics the human piece like i talked about in the beginning yeah. but then you better if you're going to work with high level golfers in this example you better really understand golf and what the real objectives are so you can say well is that going to help me or potentially hurt me even though it might be right so i always like to say the kinematic sequence is a measure of speed generation efficiency not ball striking competency and those are two different things. It's a measure of speed generation efficiency, not ball striking competency, right? So I think as long as you have that pelvis first, and I think as long as you have the club last, the two middle can be interchangeable based on your physiology. And then do you actually hit it? Not look, somebody physiology may say they they're out of order and they still they need to be in order because they hit it too short. And so you say, look, no matter how straight you hit it, you're still not good enough to compete at a world-class level. So we need to get it in better order because we need 10 more yards or whatever the case may be. And then they have to figure out how to hit it straight because without that 10 yards, they just can't compete, right? There's just a point of, hey, that's too short to be world-class. And so if your rotary mechanics aren't efficient, there we're going to have to fix them. Then it's going to be on the coach's job to help them try to hit it straight with the new speed and the new body motion. Right. So it just depends on where you fall. Like where Rory, it doesn't matter because he hits it far enough. Right. So where do you fall in that continuum from a coaching and training and teaching perspective? Love that. Love that. So uh, last time we talked, we talked about like uh, you divided like you did divide like golfer into like two kind of like what, yeah, you divide the golf swing into like two kinds of like players, like releaser and resistor. Am I right? Yeah. So, uh, can you like explain it to us again, like what exactly is releaser and what exactly is resistor? Yeah. So think about a resistor as somebody who's feeling like they're resisting their hips from turning on the backswing. So they're trying to create more coil, more tension through the torso from that kind of opposite hip to opposite shoulder, a Serapi effect, diagonal slings, spiral line, if you like to talk fascial, call it whatever <laughs> you want, right? That creates that loading of the pelvis and the torso, right? So for the people who are resisting, those people are trying to minimize the rotation of their pelvis, right? And that's usually good for people who have a lot of muscular elasticity, because that loading gives them that whipping action, right? We could think of a Tony Finau, a Gary Woodland, you know, players like that who really, I mean, Rory, right? They can store up so much energy in there and create so much speed. And they don't have to have a massively long swing, meaning they don't have as much time to create speed, right? Think about how far the club travels is also a measure of time, right? The further it goes, the more time you have to create speed. I call it the runway, right? You have a longer runway to create speed. Versus a shorter runway. Like, you know, you look at Tony Finau, he barely has his hands to here, and he can generate so much speed in the runway this long. Where if you look at Phil Mickelson, who's a releaser, meaning they let that lead knee dive in, they let the pelvis turn a lot, everything starts turning. The club is like across the line and beyond parallel. So they have a really long runway. So those are people who are not necessarily as good at using elasticity. So they're using time as a way or a longer runway to ultimately create their speed. So if you know if your athletes are elastic, then using that resisted pelvis and trying to create that bigger, what we call X-factor stretch and loading of the trunk, that's going to be a great way for speed generation. But especially if you had tend to work with people, you know, kind of in their 40s, 50s, 60s, right? Very few of them are actually super elastic. Even if they were when they were younger, they tend to need more time and a longer runway. And most of them, you know, are working, maybe they're sitting behind a desk or behind the steering wheel of a car, driving all day. Like, so those people really start losing rotate, like that transverse plane motion, that hip mobility and that trunk mobility seems to be one of the first things we lose as we age, because we just don't use it, right? We're sitting at a desk, we're sitting in a car, we're doing whatever we're doing every day. So we tend to lose that first. So those people actually need to release those hips get that bigger turn, get that club deeper and have that longer runway to create speed. But you have to also then identify is, do they have elasticity or not? And you can use various types of jump testing, looking at like counter movement jump against a rich standard squat jump. 
Like one obviously is using a stretch reflex and one is not. You know, or you can throw medicine balls where you do it with a backswing counter movement or you just start it and just throw forward and have no counter movement, right? And which one do they do better at? And, you know, while physiology tells us you're going to always do better with the counter movement, I can tell you that since I've been measuring this for the last, I don't know, six years, most almost everybody above 50 years old does better without a counter movement. Like their neural system is slower. The elasticity of their tissues is not as good. It's not as pliable. Like we can talk all we want, but we got to understand that most research on this type of stuff is being done on young college people at universities. Yeah. They're not bringing in a bunch of 60 year old dudes who've been sitting behind a desk for 40 years, 50 hours a week and saying, Hey, let's see how high you can jump or like looking at these elastic properties. So what happens is when you age, you start losing a lot of this, unless you're just been like, a gym nut workout person the whole time and you really never stop training and you've stayed on top of it and you're doing really good training and there's occasionally some people that are good at it who were kind of fall into that bucket but the average person who kind of you know life comes in their way they you know get a job maybe they get married maybe they have a kid whatever and their training goes way down or maybe they have periods of years where they even stop and now they're jumping back into it maybe now they're at a point in their career where they have a little extra time or they can get back to playing some golf or whatever, you know, tennis or whatever they're doing, those people tend to not have very good <laughs> elasticity. So the longer runway for them not only gives them an opportunity to create more speed, but it also puts a lot less torsion on your body. Like that coiled up, loaded up system puts a lot of torque and torsion inside the system. So I would say it's healthier, quote, or safer on them than that really resisted swing, especially if you don't have a lot of elasticity. If you're not, if you're, if you're a rubber, if you're trying to stretch someone like, you know, create some rubber band effect and you have a dried out old rubber band, right? That, you know, kind of is not even smooth anymore. Think about that as the person sitting behind their desk for 30 years and you go to stretch that rubber band, it tends to snap and not snap back. It doesn't yeah. tend to be really quick and explosive or the band is so stretched out, you know, maybe it's got a tiny bit of recoil, but not a lot, right? So. Yeah. Think about those people in that light, right? So either you're going to have to figure out how to make them a brand new rubber band out of the pack or move along and just don't even put them in that situation. And unless someone's coming to see you three, four, five times a week, if you get someone who's coming to see you, let's say on average twice a week and they're 55 years old and they've been sitting behind a desk for 30 years, you're never going to make that person elastic. You're just not. Like, yeah. I mean, I like to think that I'm a good coach but I don't pretend that I'm going to fix that person because that's not true. You just, you know, because the average person who comes to see you twice a week, right? Occasionally, Oh, I have the job. I can't come today or I got a family thing or I'm on vacation or I'm playing in a member guest or like, you know, you realize that at the end of the year, they missed 10 sessions. So they really average one and a half times or something a week with you. Well, if I'm sitting behind my desk for 50 hours a week and I'm at the gym for, I don't know, on average one and a half hours a week, to think that I'm going to go from that dried out ripping rubber band to that, you know, little small, really snappy one, probably not realistic. Cool. And again, I hate to say it because trainers don't want to ever say they can't fix you. Trainers make it seem like they can fix everything. Yeah. We have the cure for everything. You know, we're going to cure cancer. We're going to cure this. Oh, holistic this. <laughs> eat this, eat this, eat this. We can make like sometimes the horse is out of the barn and you just got to <laughs> live with it. Okay. This is what I'm dealing with. This is where we are. It's Okay. And there are ways for me to help them play better, do better, feel better, perform better, right? But I'm not going to try to make them a kid again. I'm going to live with where they are in life and find strategies and techniques and other things. It doesn't mean we shouldn't try to make them more mobile. It doesn't mean we shouldn't try to do all those things. But, you know, that person, you just give them a release and immediately they hit the ball 10 yards farther and they're like, oh my God, that was so easy. <laughs> well, I like that. <laughs> you know, that, that's good coaching. I love the mindset, man. I love the mindset. Yeah. So here's a question. So does the resistor and the releaser uh, change the way, change the way the weight shifts from the back leg to the front leg? And how, what does the data show on the force plate? So people who are generally resisting because they're not trying to let their heels, they're trying to create more rotary torsion, right? Those people are going to tend to use rotation a bit more as their force. 
where if I let my left knee collapse in and I try to get long and let everything turn behind it, right? It's a little bit different. So that person has, again, like I said, a longer runway or more time, right? So that person's shift to the front side could be a little bit later. It's still on time relative to their total time of movement. It's still first, it's still, you know what I'm saying? But it's still, you have more time versus somebody who's resisting it's going to happen a half and a lot quicker, right? And we have golfers who move more to their trail side. We call those like lateral golfers, right? They tend to kind of move off the ball a little bit and move more into the right side and then move back into it. Then we have people who are really centered and really rotary. We call rotary golfers, right? And then we have guys who kind of stay on their front leg a little bit more, stack and tilt. Matt Wolf is a good example of that right now, right? So if you look at like Matt Wolf is a really front posted vertical person. So those front people have more verticals. And they don't shift off nearly as much, but they need to get it on that front side because they're using that vertical as their primary speed source, right? The rotary people who are more centered, right? They have a little bit more time because they're going to really try to create this whipping turning action before they go up, right? And then the lateral person, they have the most time usually because they're getting this bigger movement and they got to get back to the left side before everything else can do it because if you stay trapped on your right you're dead right you can't you can't create rotary speed off your trail foot some guys will lean back a little bit like that with driver to increase angle of attack because the more you hit up on it also affects how far the ball goes but in generally speaking you know everybody's timing is still the same you do your lateral shift first then your torque second and then your verticals last most people do really well with two of them Meaning if you're a lateral player, you might want to do your laterals usually are, can be good and your verticals can be good, but you might not be as great as rotary. The really rotary players might be good at rotary with vertical. I would say most good players have are good at all. Almost all good players are good at vertical, but are you doing rotary with vertical? Are you doing lateral with vertical? Or are you what we call a triple threat where you're good with all of them? And understand that the lateral Really, the breaking of the lateral, the stopping of it, is what creates the speed, not the actual pushing toward the target. You push towards the target, and then you slam on those brakes, and that's what lets everything spin. Because if you keep pushing and you keep moving towards the target, you never transfer the energy effectively. You never create something like that stiff front side to hit against which allows you to release all that energy. So if you push really hard to your left thinking, oh, I want more lateral force and you can't break that amount, you'll actually be slower. You want to see your lateral breaking be high, a bigger number than your lateral push, right? That when you move left and you hit that wall, boom, everything kind of happens like that. But if you kind of start going and you keep just gliding, 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 then all of a sudden, it's hard to create speed. So understand that, you know, we would like to talk about it as like this lateral motion, but understand the actual breaking of that is more important than the pushing of that. The timing, like you said, yes, it needs to happen early and it needs to happen on time, but you got to stop it. You get, if you get there early, but you don't break it effectively, you're still dead. The breaking so, is the most important piece. Yeah, so all the time we've been chasing, like pushing, 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 Instead, we should be uh, doing probably spend more time on like braking force, right? Yeah, the, the deceleration of it, the eccentric loading of that push. And I'm not saying that the push itself isn't important, but if you keep working on how hard you're going to push to your left, let's say as a right handed golfer, and you can't break that amount and or more, you're actually, your training is actually making you slower. Yeah, I love this. It makes people's heads want to pop off, but it's like, you know, I see so much <laughs> stuff on the internet and trainers like, oh, you got to work on your lateral push, push, push. It's like, mm. most of you guys are going to end up being able to push so hard that it's going to overwhelm the brakes. And while your pushing is going to get really good, your club head speed is actually going to go down. Yeah, great. So I want to go back to the force play data. So does that mean that resistor going to probably... The weight shifting is probably a little bit less to the back leg, and the releaser is going to spit through, uh, have yes. more weight shift to, to the back. Yes. 
because the because the, the because the releaser is literally releasing the front side to let everything move more back and around to create that distance. So sure. does that mean that the resistor have like not really even, but the left leg and the right leg, the way it should be, is a little bit even, right? Well, a little, I wouldn't say it's not like you're 50 50, but it's less than the releaser would have. Yeah. All right. There's still a weight shift. And obviously, the releaser has the most, or the lot, and the lateral player has the most. The resistor is in the middle. And then the vertical, or that, you know, front post, or whatever word you want to, Mike Adams called the launcher, or whatever word you want to use, that person has the least shift back. Yeah. Right. So. There's a continuum of all of that, but obviously the person who releases, even though they move more off of it and all that stuff, they also now have more time to get back because their movement, the club is further behind them. Yeah. So they have more time to get everything synced up. The other ones, as the, they get shorter, the relationship is the same, but the total time is less. Cool. So everything's got to happen a little bit sooner. Cool. So I want to go back to you mentioned about the break is more important, right? So mm -hmm. is there like certain like ratio between like pushing and the braking force would be like? The, the, the higher the braking relative to the pushing, the better. So like if you look at someone like a Kyle Berkshire, who's, you know, arguably the longest hitter in the world, his braking force is double his pushing force is something like that. Double? Double. Cool. So, so you know, yeah. I think the more the better. And almost all the recreational golfers I've ever tested, almost every one of them pushes more than they break. And so, understand that you the break can be two things. Breaking can be you push with your right leg to your left and your left leg then pushes back. Or because the magnitude of those forces are lower, I can just be so good at my verticals. So I'm moving this way. But if I push so hard that way, it will stop this. I won't be able to keep moving if I just overwhelm that. So what I tell people is, and if you look at good graphs, what you'll see is peak horizontal braking will line up exactly with peak vertical force. They're using massive verticals to stop the horizontals. They're not necessarily braking and pushing backward. There's a little bit of that, don't get me wrong but the actual force gets pushed back because you go so hard up. Oh. Yeah. All right, so like, let's just say you're moving. Let's just say someone's pushing you forward and then somebody's pushing you up at the same time. You're put, someone's pushing you this way and someone, and let's say this person's pushing you with 10 pounds of pressure, force, whatever, right? But at the same time, this person pushes you with 50 pounds of force. Well, guess what? You're going to go straight up. Because the 10 is not close enough to the 50. Yeah. The 50 will just say, oh, I'm moving this way and up. Well, if this one is so high, you'll just go straight up. Yeah. And that's really what the best players are doing. Whoa. Cool. So uh, since the breaking force is like, like you mentioned, the more the better. And at the high end of the athlete, they probably produce like twice their – twice the breaking force of their pushing well that's How? the best in the world is doing that but yeah yeah so does that mean like you spend a lot of like time doing like uh eccentric work on spend more time on uh decelerating and eccentric training yeah. and, and even like lots of side planks and different like any type of dynamic lateral frontal plane loading of the trunk because look if i start breaking with my lower body hard but my lower my upper body doesn't have stability strength whatever and then i start getting tipped this way my upper body gets pushed backward and side bent too much a i put my back at risk of injury and b my impact alignments and hitting down especially with my irons are going to be terrible because i got to be able to break my whole system from my front foot all the way up to my lead shoulder. 
If I break, my lower body stops and my upper body gets pushed back because it can't control it, or my upper body keeps going, both of those are bad. So I need to make sure I integrate my trunk properly with that lower body stability stuff. Cool. So since we brought up like eccentric and like breaking force, can you like give up give us some ex example about like probably some exercise you're gonna do and how would you program it? Yeah, so I like to use in my gym, I have a lot of flywheel type stuff. So using flywheels obviously is inherently driven around eccentric breaking. Right. So if I'm do a lateral lunge or a lateral squat, say with like a hip belt on or something on a flywheel, every time I come in, that wheel is still spinning and it's trying to suck me into the back into the machine. So I got to really put those brakes on. And so we obviously talked to our athletes about you got to put on the brakes hard and get out as quick as you can. Right. So to really change and be quick in that amortization phase and get out of the get out of I say get out of the hole is the term I use your lateral lunge in I'm like you're down in the hole now get out of the hole as fast as you can right and I when I want them to get out I don't want them to come out low and back I want to feel like backing up right because I want that vertical component linked into that lateral component right so if I make a vector like this let's just say this is part lateral and part vertical if I push straight up it would be purely vertical or if I push straight back where my feet stayed and my hips stayed level and low to the ground, that would be purely horizontal. I want to see it somewhere in that middle zone where I have some lateral breaking, but with a vertical component at the same time, because the downswing is 0.3 seconds. I don't have time to like go one piece, one piece, one piece, one piece. I need to like create like a net effect, right? Um, like a summation or whatever, a resultant force, should we say, I would create a resultant force that ends up in the right direction that I want to go. So uh, what if like people, they don't have like flywheel? What can so they you do? You can do plyometrics. You can do like a, like a slow level, like lateral bound. And then like, as soon as you hop to your left foot, it goes straight up. You can go jump to your left foot straight up in a tiny bit back. So you're making like a little triangle. So it's like backward, but it's a vertical backward. So maybe I land, let's just say my feet are, four feet apart, I bound to here and I jump up and back and I land right there. So now I've got this vertical yet horizontal breaking force and I'm stopping the momentum of that bound going forward. So I can do that with no equipment at all, right? And if you really want to get your hips to clear more, you can go bound up, back and actually behind you a little bit, right? That pushing that foot forward, which will drive your hip back. So it's like you're going left, you're going up, you're coming towards the direction you started, but actually a little bit behind you, like like behind my back, and that kind of vector. Cool. So right now I don't need any equipment for that. Yeah, great. I mean, you could do like even the flywheel stuff. You could do that with a regular cable column. It's just not as dynamic. Yeah. So, uh, when you mention like there's a lot of like breaking force, especially mm -hmm. like uh vertically instead of like laterally push back does that mean that you're gonna spend more time on let's say saddle saddle plane probably like uh yeah vertical force instead of like lateral yeah i would say that i'd say that's true i mean certainly from the explosive component of it because yeah. most people and again while I say that, that's just in general, but obviously with everybody, we're testing them. I actually know what forces they're doing well or not doing well. I have their whole physical assessment on what, you know, again, are they not doing it well because it's a physical problem or are they not doing it well because it's a technical problem, right? Like if somebody has certain issues of instability or movement quality or whatever, and I just throw them on a flywheel and say, oh, do this breaking thing. Oh, well, that may or may not make them better if that's really not what they need that's assuming you can move well then that becomes a tool if you don't move well you got to fix that first so want to go back to like the force play so uh at the beginning we only have like vertical force for the force plate but now we have like we can do like uh 3d right so uh I have three. I have three D dual force plates. Yeah, and swing catalyst. So, 
uh, does that tra- changes the way you view these data? Like, is there like any metric you you're gonna be ch- tracking? Yeah, I mean, obviously it changes. I mean, now you can start looking at, oh, well, I'm over pushing with my right, or is it that you're over pushing with your right too much, or is that you keep pushing too long and that actually the push is okay, but you need to turn it off sooner? Is it like the magnitude, or is it the time? Right. So you can start seeing some of those type of things with force plate data. The other thing that's really cool about Swing Catalyst is it has pressure also. And then it, and within the pressure, it has thermography of your feet. And you can see where the hot spots are, where you're pushing the ground the most. And let's just say I'm trying to look at that braking we just talked about. I move from right foot to my left foot. I'm looking at my braking. But if I see that the person's pressure, if I look at the thermography and the hot is all on the outside of their foot, I know there's no way to break from there that they need to stay in pronation eversion to properly break that force to create the vector that's the right vector, right? So now I'm starting to think, okay, if I didn't do a good job with my screening, well, what's going on with their ankle? Why are they quickly to roll to the outside where they can't, you know, first I could say, hey, try to keep, you know, the spike right behind the ball of your, you know, on the ball of your foot into the ground while you do it. If they can't do that right away and you still see it roll, then you got to wonder what's going on with the eversion of their ankle. Right. So like you can start connecting dots. The more you understand the data from pressure to thermography to forces to braking to acceleration, like, you know, again, it takes time to really get good at going through all of this data and understanding what you're looking at and then connecting it properly back to your physical screen. But, you know, it's a layered approach and, you know, you start with learning and it gets better and better. And the more you look at it, the better you get at it. And like anything, you know, you're going to get out of it the amount of time and effort you put into it. But, you know, don't, if you don't really understand it, be careful trying to change it. Because I see a lot of people making people worse. Because, you know, I see golf pros often using some of this stuff without understanding the physiology. And the way they're trying to change it based on how the person moves is just wrong. And you're potentially going to hurt them. And or you're just not going to get there and they're going to get frustrated <laughs> or whatever. I mean, obviously, there's a lot of great golf coaches out there today who will go send their people out to a good trainer and say, hey, just can you get a screen for me? I always tell people, you know, getting screened doesn't mean you have to train. But that the value of that information to the golf professional, if you have a golf professional who understands the body, is invaluable. right? So just so he knows, hey, this is what Eric can or can't do. So he doesn't start wasting time going down paths to improve you that are just never going to work, right? So even if you say, I never want to exercise, I would still say, get an evaluation if you want to get better and let your golf professional, if you're taking lessons, have that information. Great, great. Last thing, okay? Last thing before they go. So for all those like uh, rotational athletes, there's probably going to be a lot of like asymmetry. So how to deal with these asymmetry without like uh, letting them get injured? Yeah, so obviously, you know, when you talk about tennis and sports like that, you have forehand and backhand where golf is rotary, but it's an asymmetrical rotary. We never hit any golf balls lefty if we're righty and vice versa. Um, so obviously, the more the person plays golf, the bigger the asymmetry, right? So that's the funny part is like, you know, if you're working with tour players, they have potentially the biggest asymmetries because they've just hit the most balls in their lives. You know, these guys have hit millions and millions of golf balls where maybe an amateur maybe plays once or twice a week. Maybe they warm up for 15 minutes on the range and then they go play golf on Saturday and Sunday. Like they're not hitting that many balls. So managing those asymmetries is obviously going to be really important from a health perspective so obviously even in the gym if we're doing any of these type of plyos or any of these things obviously we're talking about the breaking obviously doing it in the direction of your swing is going to help your performance but obviously we always got to do those things bilaterally and do them the other way even though you're not going to use your body that way just from a muscular balance perspective you know one of the training aids that i don't necessarily love from a golf performance perspective but i love from a symmetry perspective is the old-fashioned golf swing fans I don't know if it's like a golf handle and it's got like four paddle blades on it. And it's like a fan. So it creates air resistance as you swing. So it's actually pretty tough to try to move it fast. So I love taking that for people and saying, hey, let's take some lefty swings, if you're righty, obviously, or vice versa. 
um, in between sets in the gym, or when you come in, give me 10 or 15 swings lefty. And then before you leave, give me 10 or 15 swings lefty, because just the resistance on that from a muscular perspective is probably each one of those swings is probably worth 10, five or 10 real swings because the load is very high. So again, I don't care what it looks like. It doesn't have to look like this perfectly coordinated movement, but let's just load those tissues a bit going the other way to create some balance. And because the resistance is decently high, you know, at the end of the workout, we did 10 at the beginning, 10 between a couple different sets of exercises and 10 at the end, maybe you did a hundred swings or 50 swings or whatever it is. That's probably worth a couple hundred swings. And it's a really easy, specific way to do it. And then obviously with your exercises, even if you're doing like a rotary med ball throw or anything that's trying to work on their movements, always do it both ways, just from a balance perspective, even though it sometimes it doesn't look super cool coordinated on the offside, you know, who cares? Cool. Appreciate that, man. I really love this. Yeah. Awesome. No worries, man. My pleasure. Really appreciate for you answering my invitation. So if there's like uh, coaches or therapists are interested in what we're talking about today, where can they reach out to you? Uh, you can find me on Instagram at ben.shear. Um, my website for the golf, I have two websites. One is for my overall athletic business, which is uh, www.athleticedge.net, N-E-T. And then I also have Ben Shear, S-H-E-A-R, golf.com, uh, where you can find more information and probably hit me up through there. But you can always, like I said, you can send me a message through Messenger on Instagram. is easy to do as well. Or, you know, if somebody even wanted to email me, it's ben at bensheargolf.com. Cool. So is there going to be like uh another like bench golf mentorship next year yeah i'm gonna do another one i was i was just about to start up another one recently but then my schedule got messed up i had to cancel it so i'm just trying to figure out my schedule with my tour players when i'm actually going to be around to do it this year but yeah so we're trying to give people like do some mentorships and help people really take their knowledge to a whole new level uh and take a little bit deeper dive for people who are really serious about working with golfers so where can I find out the mentorship? Uh, the new dates aren't up, but I keep that. That is on the benchyourgolf.com website where I kind of post that stuff. And if anybody just wanted to even be on like my mailing list distribution, when I put it, when I come up with my new list, I do have a list of people that I email and saying, hey, here are the new dates. That's what I'm doing. So if anybody is interested in being added to that potential list, they can like, again, just contact me any of the same ways I just mentioned. Cool. Appreciate it, man.